Uh, take a look at the title today, To Keep Them Alive. As we're taking a look and we're approaching the flood, uh, so often we think about the devastation, and believe me, there was global de devastation in the uh, deluge, but too often we don't think about what God was doing, and he was actually saving and pre preserving mankind. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, in our uh, series, Archaic, looking back deep into man's history, uh, we have been looking through this lens of scriptures to a period of time after creation where the population on earth could have been very easily in the millions. But along with that, we look at the corruption that was happening. We see that from scriptures, Genesis chapter 6, and this is kind of a mind-blowing type thing, but we, hear, we, we read about divine beings who left their first estate, who saw the daughters of men and, and had a relationship with them, contaminating the bloodline of man, where in Genesis chapter 3, God had promised the seed, the promised seed that would be the Savior, and, and cont this attempt to contaminate the bloodline of human beings. We also seen the proverbial Pandora's box opened before the flood. Things that we can't even imagine today, the type of chaos and evil that was happening. Minds and hearts of the humankind bent continuously, the scripture says, continually, habitually on evil. Think about this. Unbridled evil. Unbridled. Unlike anything we have ever seen. There is no justice. No justice. Let me just ask you a question. I'm going to ask this probably twice or three times, but when you see some of the things that happen today, maybe it's in your own family. Maybe it's at work or in the community. Maybe it's in our country. Maybe it's even the world. Do we see some horrendous things? Just raise your hand. Do we see some horrendous things happening? Some real evil in the world. And I just want to ask you, do you believe in justice? Do you believe in justice for this? Yes, we do. And we're going to take a look and see what God was thinking and what he was doing. Because after this, what had been happening for quite some time, you know what God said? God said, enough. Last week, we observed God commanding Noah, Noah, you make an ark. And God gave specifics on this ark. And then he said, for behold... I will bring a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, and that earth, that's land. I will bring a flood of the waters upon the land to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Now, there are many challenges to global flooding, especially by secular society, but I believe there is a tremendous amount of proofs I don't need the proofs other than the scripture, but it's nice. isn't it nice to have some, some uh, corroborating material that really points to the truth? And we have it today. There's a tremendous amount of proof in history, in ge uh, geology, in paleontology. There are proofs. In all the ologies you can think of, there is proof. Uh, John D. Morris and Tim LaHaye uh, gathered material in their book, uh, the Ark on Ararat, and they said they, there are over 200 ancient cultures. John MacArthur came up with 270 ancient cultures who give an account for the flood. Ancient cultures. They were there very close to the beginning. That amazes me. And then we have these geological, uh, paleontological evidences. I love this picture. That's uh, the Himalayas. And guess what they found? I think it's 12,000 feet up. I can't remember. Way up in Himalayas, they found marine fossils. Marine fossils on mountains in the Himalayas. Now, of course, the secular scientists will come up with an explanation. And, and oftentimes, if I've read some of them, it takes more faith to believe in what they're saying. <laughs> I might share one with you next, uh, next week, possibly. But really, think about that. There are fossils, ammonite fossils, high in the Himalayas, 
in, in, the, in the limestone and in, in, in the rock. And why not a flood, folks? Why not a flood? Why not a flood? Uh, I read a, a New York Times article. I can't remember the year, and I'll, I'll bring it next week. But uh, they, they found whale fossils high in the Andes. Whale fossils high in the Andes. And I'm asking, why not a flood? Although some accounts uh, from these 200 ancient or more accounts of the flood may be, might have some distortions because of oral tradition and in their writings, uh, this is, I think, very interesting among those 200 or more. This is the percentage. 95 speak of a universal flood. This is ancient cultures. 95 speak of a universal flood. 88% speak of a favored family, Noah. 66 say it was because of the wickedness of man. 73% speak of animals being saved. 70% speak about, uh, 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 of a boat that saved a family. And 57% says that survivors landed on a what? Where did they get this from? Because after the Tower of Babel, they dispersed all over, the, all over the world. Unless they have this common history. And through their generation after generation, through oral uh, uh, re- re- resuscitation, uh, reciting, I should say, and, and, and written language, we, we get these accounts. I think this is, I'm asking, why not a flood? Why not a flood? And one of my favorite things, which I shared last week, but I had to share it again, is the the ancient Chinese sign or character for the word boat. You ready for this? How many have not seen it yet? Okay. This is the ancient character for the word boat in Chinese. Look to the left, and it's the word boat, and it's broken down into three sub-characters, eight mouths and vessels. Now, the reason why I say a mouth, that is the, the closest interpretation. And you may say, well, mouths, what does that mean? If you're working overtime and you're working and working, I work hard for my money that time. You know what I'm saying? You're working hard. And somebody asks you and they say, well, why are you working so hard? You say, I have a big family. I have eight mouths to feed. And that's why we have this character. For a boat, it's a vessel that had eight mouths or persons. Where did they come up with this? Where, where do they come up with this? This is before Christianity. This is before the Bible for them. Where did they come up with this? Unless they had a common history. As they departed, broke off from other societies and cultures and, and had their own. So we read, God said, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring to every sort in the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Male and female. God's plan, right? Male and female. Amen? Amen. All right. Genesis uh, 6.20. I'm going to read it from my... Of the birds according to their kinds, that's important, to their kinds, which... I'll ask a question. An elephant is not a chicken, is it? All right. I guess you can have an elephant that is a chicken if they're afraid of a mouse, I suppose, but let's not go too deep theologically here, okay? But a dog's not a cat, right? according to their kinds. Of the birds, according to their kinds, of the animals, according to their kinds, most likely those are the larger animals. And of every creeping thing, probably the smaller animals, according to its kind, of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. And there is the word, to keep them alive. And that's the the title today, to keep them alive. Even just as interesting is the Miao tribe, which is an ancient tribe that occupied most of inland China, uh, south of the Yangtze River, 
and they were driven to the, uh, I think, the southern mountains by the Chinese army that was much stronger. Their tradition is very precise on creation, on the flood, and on the Tower of Babel. Uh, in their literature, they actually have the, the name Nua, representing Noah and his three sons. They do not claim to be Chinese. They claim to be in Indo-European descent, but they can trace their descent to Japheth, one of Noah's sons. And they actually have, in their oral tradition, they can go all the way back to Adam, and his name was Dirt. Now, there's a joke there somewhere. But you know what I'm saying? Adam means earth, right? It means dirt. And the reason why they can be so accurate as they go back and they recall is every funeral, every wedding, every public occasion, they recite it generation after generation after generation after generation. And so we have an account of creation, and we also have an account of the flood translated by Edgar A. Truax. And I'm just going to get a little started. This is amazing. And this is the flood tradition according to the Mia, Mia'o people. So it poured 40 days in sheets and torrents, then 55 days of misting and drizzle. The waters surmounted the mountains and ranges. The deluge ascended left valley and hollow, an earth with no earth upon which to take refuge, a world with no foothold where one might subsist. The people were baffled, impotent, and ruined, despairing, horror-stricken, diminished, and finished. And it continues. But the patriarch Nua was righteous. The matriarch Gabo Luen upright. And we have no, nothing in the Bible that talks about his wife uh, and a name or anything other than she, she was his wife. But we have the patriarch, the matriarch. And when we read, they built a boat very wide, made a ship very fast, strong. Their house their household entire got aboard and were floated. The family complete rode the deluge in safety. The animals, were the animals with them were male and female. The birds went along and were mated in pairs. This predates Christianity. This predates someone coming in with an Old Testament Bible. This is their recollection of what happened in the beginning. It is probably out of the 200 to 250 accounts of the flood, this is probably the closest to the Bible. And so I want to ask you again, why not a flood? Why not a flood? God said, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kinds, and the animals according to their kinds, of the creeping things of the ground according to its kind. Two of every sort shall come into you, shall come into you to keep them alive. And there's the theme, there's the idea here. As God has to uh, exact judgment and justice for the wickedness that was happening, his ultimate goal has always do, has been to preserve life, to save. Even in, in, the old, in the old world. We also read, God said, And take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. God is preparing Noah for the end. And we read that Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. And you know what this is telling us? And we've seen it quite a few times before, maybe never recognized it. What this is telling us is that Noah had faith. He had faith. No one knew of God's promise. I mean, you know, Adam, Adam, Adam and, and all the lineage, you know, they were still living within a hundred, couple hundred years of Noah. No one knew about the promise given of the seed, the Messiah, the, the Savior. And God trusted that 
that God was going to protect that seed and that line in order that one day mankind would be saved through that seed. God kept his promise to Noah and to the other patriarchs all the way back to Adam. And Noah believed God. In fact, Noah's entire obedience expressed entirely his faith. And that's why speaking of the old faithful, a little pun there, I didn't mean it, but the old faithful, you know, in the Old Testament, those believers, as we looked at a few previously, but in Hebrews eleven seven 7, in the New Testament, and we're looking back, Hebrew writer writes, by what? Faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events yet un- as yet unseen. And this is important because in the New Testament, as Christians now, we know the Lord will return. There'll be a rapture, we'll, the church will go up, but there's a second coming, we'll come back with him. But it's right now, it's unseen, there's nothing, there's no ticking, there's no clock going where we can say, well, you know, we're just, we're just three days, 48 minutes, you know, none of that. And in fact, I think someone just attempted a few weeks ago to have a date, which was, I think, uh, uh, last Monday or the Monday before, something like that, I don't know if you were, they were, they were saying this, I bet they feel pretty silly now, don't they? By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear and awe, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. This is why God told him to build an ark. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by what? Faith. Faith. There's no pulling ourselves by our bootstrap and saying, boy, you know, patting ourselves on the back, saying, what a good girl, what good boy am I. It's by faith. To know God is true, he can trust him. He is faithful in all situations, even when we're not. And do I understand all of it? No. Do I know why he does what he does sometimes? No. I, but I know he lives. <laughs> and I know he has saved me. And I know I have a future. And so what we see here, whether it's the New Testament or the Old Testament, but the idea for the flood was to exact judgment and and justice, but also to save, to keep them alive. And again, I want to go back to the previous question. When you see injustice, maybe in your family or in your community, uh, in your country, in the world, your friends, when you see the exploitation of the vulnerable, uh, horrendous brutality, of man against man. The strong that are gaining by someone else's weakness. Don't you want justice? Balanced justice? Because we're appalled at some of the things that happen today in this life, in this world. The things that we see occur in the, in, in, in the world, in our country. We're appalled, and so is God. It's called sin. So is God. If God did not exact judgment for sin and for these injustices, if he did not meet it with justice, then there would be no justice. The flood is God's exacting justice on a wicked world. But it was God's goal to save man. It was God's goal to give grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. So that mankind would have the fulfillment of the seed going down from Adam to to Noah, to Abraham, to Jacob, to Isaac. Or Isaac to Jacob. They have this physical descent of the seed, which one day at the right time would be the Messiah. Jesus, uh, when he, in the New Testament, when he's talking about his uh, second coming, there's a reason why he, he talks and, and compares it to the days of Noah. Because if, if you think it's bad now, it's going to get worse later down the road. 
Jesus said, concerning that day or hour, no one really knows. The second coming. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and given in marriage until the day when the Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. Now keep this in mind for a moment. Swept them all. Would you say swept them all away with me? Swept them all away. Because we're going to go to something else in a moment. One more time. You did such a great job. Swept them all away. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now think about this. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Well, usually we think the one who was taken is the one who's saved, right? Well, the rapture's happened. We come back with the Lord in the second coming as he sets foot on earth. And the one that is taken is equal to the one who was swept away in the flood. As we, those who are believers, will be in the millennial kingdom. We also read, two women will be grinded, grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. The one who was taken is the one who equal to being swept away. Even Jesus in the parable of the tares and, tares and weeds, right? I'm sorry, the tares and the wheat. Growing together, right? Until judgment day when the tares are pulled, the weeds are pulled separately and destroyed. And the wheat remains. Do you see it? D- does it make sense? And this is why we should have such a passion about uh, the salvation of people coming to the Lord. And, what, and again, it's, it's not as though we or they have to, to pull themselves up and to meet these. It is faith in God and in Jesus Christ that we are saved, that we are his followers. I mean, I don't know about you, but life's pretty tough. And to believe in God, that's, that's a pretty good deal. And we see that God will also exact justice one day, but he also wants to save people. He wants to save men, women, boys, and girls. In fact, in 2 Peter 5, Peter wrote in the New Testament, if he, God, did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world, of the ungodly. Now, please, I, I realize this is an incomplete sentence, okay? I know that. But do you get the point? Do you get the gist of it? See, it's not just about judgment and justice, which, again, we would not want anything else. But it's also about God who has the right and who has the power to ex- exact justice along with grace because he is mighty to save. In fact, we read in the New Testament, Paul wrote, it is God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And concerning the wicked pre-flood, we read, Peter wrote, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. God's patience waited have you ever waited patiently for something? You're not too good, yeah. And how about 120 years? Can you wait, can, wait 120 years patiently? Is that going to happen? God's pretty good, isn't he? He's pretty patient. And even with that, he was waiting. Waiting for what? Waiting for people to turn around, to change. Change their minds, change their hearts, change their direction. Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, which is about 100, 120 years, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. That's pretty patient. That's a whole lot more patient than I am. And on top of that, we don't 
extend grace like God does either, do we? We don't extend grace like he does. We try to. It's our goal. And we understand what his love is. We can give it because we've received it. But we have a hard time with even that. But he doesn't. He doesn't. We, Peter wrote in Second Peter, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, toward all of us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance, which means to change your mind. And, the, and changing your mind so closely related to that is you change your direction. Last week we uh, touched on this, and I think it's really important. Uh, is anyone colorblind here? Anyone Are you, that you know of, you're colorblind? Do you, uh, years ago there was a, a test, there were these slides that a person who was colorblind or not take a look at, and um, there was just a slight variation in a color that kind of popped out, and you would say, okay, I can see it, I can see it. And then, uh, but if you couldn't see this number or a, a letter of an alphabet, if you can't see it in this mix, you might be colorblind. And it's, it's one of, here's one of them right here, okay? Uh, so if you're not colorblind, you can see that this is an eight, right? Okay. Yeah, it's a 10, okay. Now, here's the thing about being colorblind is you, it's not your fault. If you can't see that 10 in there, it's not your fault. It's just the way it is, right? It's just the way it is. It's not willful. You just can't see it if you're colorblind. But you know, there are people, and I'll tell you, this, this was me as far as uh, wrestling with the ideas of creation, especially, and looking at evolution and how trying to make things fit. This is part of me with my, my ignorance. But along with being colorblind, there are some people who are creation blind. And they have put on the wrong glasses to view the beginning of the world. There are some people who are also flood blind. They will come up with every other type of explanation rather than just trusting the word of God, that which was laid down in the beginning. And get what? guess what? We weren't there, God was. Not only was he the creator, he was the witness to everything that happened. So we can be colorblind, we can be creation blind, flood blind. But it's not just about blindness, it's also about being deaf. We can be deaf to the, the very words of God as we wrestle with secular society. We can be deaf to those, the words of truth that are coming towards us from Scripture, God's words, and be listening to the, the, to the, the words of man and some of the crazy ideas that they have. And that is willful. That is willful. And believe me, I, as far as creation goes years ago, I, that was me. I, I was one of those. I tried, until I really looked down and looked at the scriptures. A great example of this, uh, uh, when the church was born and, and Jesus had died, he rose, he spent 40 days with his disciples, he went into heaven. The church is born. The first uh, person to be martyred for the faith was uh, Stephen. We, we read about this in Acts chapter 7. Now, he was talking to the Jewish religious people at that time, and uh, he told those re religious leaders things they did not like to hear. And these are, these are the, the leaders of Israel, okay? And being the mature adult people that they were, uh, we read in Acts chapter 7 that they put their hands over their ears and started, la, 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 la. They started making all this noise, literally, so they wouldn't hear it as they're rushing towards Stephen to drag him out of the city and stone him to death. They were blind, but they were also deaf. Willfully blind and willfully deaf. Is it possible for us to shut our eyes and, and kind of stop our ears too for some truths that may be inconvenient or well, we've so been sold on what the world has thrown at us that we so willingly just almost blindly follow
Jesus spoke to this in the New Testament uh, in Matthew 13, 13. Jesus said, this is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear nor understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear but never understand and you will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's hearts has grown what? Dull. And I think that's willingful, willingfully ignorant. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears, they can barely hear. And their eyes, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. And I would heal them. And then Jesus speaks to his followers to his disciples, he says to them, but blessed, happy, to be envied are your eyes. For they see and your ears, for they hear. All Jesus' followers have to say, amen. Amen.